Awesome, guys. Now we are cooking with gas. Glad everybody's checking in in the chat box. Um, we'll get going. We want to make the most of our time. Um, please stay muted as much as you can and try not, if you're going to think you're going to be a possible distraction on the screen, turn your screen off so we don't see you. That would be awesome. So that way we can roll through this and everybody's um, getting their questions answered and listening. Um, so for the start, I am Allie. I am the director of Fast Pitch here with Softball Youth. Um, most of you should know me by now, but for those that don't, I'll keep it short. I have um, 10 years of Division I coaching experience. Um, I recently took this position with Athletic Sports Group and Softball Youth, and it's been really awesome so far working with so many of you. Um, but I try to do as much as I can to bring my college coaching experience back and give some um, of that insight to you guys. We are here with Alicia Wolney. Wait, raise your hand, Alicia. So everyone hey, guys. Talk. Um, Alicia is my right-hand man at Softball Youth. Um, she's amazing. She played at the University of Louisville. She was an All-American, member of the Great Britain national team, really, really high-end athlete and player, and um, an even better person. So all of you guys I know are super, super lucky. Lacey, say hi. Hey, guys. Guest of honor, Lacey Waldrop. I hope all of you know what a big deal she is in the softball world. If you don't, you better hit Google right now. Um, I'm going to give you a laundry list of all of the really amazing things that she has done in her softball career, um, things that I could have only dreamed to do. And um, it's really, really an honor to have you here, Lacey. So thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Quick update on her. Um, Lacey was an athlete at Florida State. Um, get down your pen and paper and have 30 minutes for all of these accolades because it's a long list. She was the uh, two-time ACC Pitcher of the Year. She received 16 ACC Player of the Week awards, three-time All-Region, three-time All-American, and the biggest one, I think, 2014 USA Softball National Player of the Year. That is such a tremendous honor um, and even cooler for a pitcher to get it. As a non-pitcher myself, um, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but it's a really big deal for a pitcher to be able to get it over so many amazing position players. Um, another really awesome award she won is the 2015 Lowe's Senior Class Award. If you don't know what that is, you should definitely write it down. Um, Lowe's Senior Class Award, it is the pinnacle award in all of athletics for really admirable seniors that do things on and off the field. So it basically means Lacey was just awesome all around and everything that she did. Um, a few records that she has at Florida State, she was first in wins, second in appearances, third in strikeouts, um, and fourth in saves. She was also the third round draft pick and won back-to-back -back championships with the Bandits. Um, she had coaching stints at Oklahoma and Duke, and now she is the main lady at Softball Rebellion, which is a really awesome training facility. Um, she does pitching lessons, obviously. They have Baseball Rebellion, which has been around for a while, really unbelievable hitting um, techniques and lessons available there. So definitely check those guys out. All right, so we're gonna get right to it. The way we want this to roll is I have some talking points. I have some really cool things I wanna discuss with Lacey, but really I want you guys to use this chat box to ask her things that you wanna know. They can be about pitching because she obviously is an incredible pitcher. They can be about recruiting. They can be about fitness. Um, but all the, between the three of us, we have some pretty awesome resources that we can get you guys some really great answers. But in the meantime, um, before those things start getting rolling, Let's talk a little bit about what all of you guys have been doing while you have been on quarantine and lockdown as far as softball training. And Lacey, let's talk a little bit about what you got you uh, at Softball Rebellion and you personally recommend while everybody's um, sitting at home. Yeah, so I think this is such a unique time because I'm sure for you guys, whether you're 12 to 18, there's probably not going to be another time in your softball career that you're going to have this big of a break where you don't have games because we play so much now between travel ball, middle school, high school, all those things you're playing all the time. And so now you get this break and you're probably wondering, what do I do? What's the best way to utilize this time? And I think for one, it's a huge time to develop certain skills. You don't really have to stay ready to play, I would say, because there's obviously some time until that, but now's a really great time to work on something that you've struggled with before. So for pitching, I think it's great to work on your mechanics up close because that's when you're going to start to really see some changes. And those are the things that really start to lead to better 
healthier mechanics that are going to keep you pitching longer. You'll gain speed, all those things. And stuff like that's really hard to change when you're in the middle of playing. So now is the perfect time. Um, if you're a little bit older, maybe you're learning to develop a new pitch that spins a little bit differently than maybe your fastball or your changeup. Um, but yeah, it's, you can be really specific and detailed to what you know you need to do better. And I think a lot of times too, something that gets overlooked in softball, we're so skill oriented that we forget about fitness. Like you could spend so much of your time right now getting stronger and that would help you out so much more than just pitching or just hitting. Like you really need to be an all around athlete and now is the time to do it. Yeah, total, totally great advice. I think another thing that um, I've been speaking on that a lot of you guys probably don't pay a lot of attention to at your age, which I totally get. Um, but nutrition, now's a really awesome time to get with your parents and get in the kitchen and learn how to cook and learn how to take care of yourself and eat well. Um, when you get to college, you are going to get sick of ramen noodles in a hurry. I promise you that. Um, so make sure you guys get in there and figure out how to, how to cook really great food. Oh, here's a great question. I just got one coming in. Lacey, everyone wants to know, um, about your, this one was to me privately. And you guys, if you, anyone feels more comfortable asking your questions privately, you can totally shoot them to me. Um, that's fine. And I'll, and we'll, we'll, you know, keep it comfortable that way. Um, Lacey, what was your um, velocity when you pitched? So in college, I would say I sat around 62 to 64. There might've been a couple times that I got a little bit above that if my adrenaline was really going. Um, but I was a pitcher that really relied on changing speeds a lot. So if you were watching a radar gun in a college game, it would probably vary from anywhere like 43 with my change up to 63 or 64 with my fastball. And then my curve and rise were like in between there. So didn't always throw super hard, but got it done. Okay. Raise your hand if you think 62 to 64 is super hard. <laughs> I, I definitely do for sure well now talk a little bit about the difference between um your velocity in the bullpen with no hitter versus game time velocity yeah and actually as a coach I saw this a lot it is very challenging to replicate the scenario of a hitter in the box and just your adrenaline pumping because in practice you're fine-tuning you're working on things but you don't have that same like Ooh, I'm breathing heavy. I see that batter in the box, know exactly what I'm doing. So I think what you'll start to notice is that you probably throw a lot harder, not a lot harder, but maybe a mile an hour or two harder in games than you do in the bullpen. And that's something if parents are on here, I think that's an important thing to track because so often we're giving these speeds to coaches, you know, recruiting, or we're just talking to parents. Oh, my daughter throws this, throws that. But what does she throw in a game? Because in the game is really the most important. That's when you're getting hitters out. So what's my game speed and how can I make it similar to that as close to it as possible in practice, but it's not always going to happen. Can you talk, Lacey, a little bit? We spoke about this earlier, um, about when you transitioned to playing elite level select ball. Talk a little bit about when you started pitching, but when you really started pitching and what the difference is and what that looked like for you. Not and just. this goes for playing. This doesn't, this isn't necessarily mean like when we're speaking to all of you guys, this isn't only for pitchers. I mean, this like elite level jump to get to the, the next step. This, this is all position specific. Yeah. So I started playing softball in general. I started with slow pitch when I was nine, I think. And then the next year I transitioned to fast pitch, always played positions growing up too. I really didn't start being a pitcher only until I was in high school and playing for an upper level travel team. Um, but I started pitching when I was 11. And then I would say it was around the time I was in eighth grade going into ninth grade that I really started to feel like, okay, I could do something special with this and I want to play in college. But I would say actually, we'll go back step a little bit. I was probably 12 or 13 when I really got serious about pitching and working out and practicing three and four times a week being very diligent with what I was trying to do. And I can remember a very specific winter break that I went with my coach and three times a week, we would throw 45 minutes to an hour of just fastball and change up work. And I remember my um, accuracy just going way through the roof that next spring after that work through the winter season. 
So that's a really good message to send because now everyone's talking about playing elite level select bot 10 U, elite level select bot 12 U. And don't get me wrong, if you have the ability to do that and you're in a situation regionally, financially, where you can do that, that's awesome. But I mean, you just told everybody as a all American that you didn't start playing high level select bot until high school. So I think that is a really good message that it's never too late if you really want to do it and you really want to play at the next level and get better. Um, yeah. That is, you know, totally a possibility. And I think now with the recruiting changes that you can't actually visit and, and talk and do those things till junior year, it gives you a little bit longer window to play locally and develop your skills before you take that jump. For sure. Things have definitely, definitely changed um, in the past few years. And that's, that's a good thing for everybody here. Um, another question on the recruiting front, um, and I love all the recruiting questions. It's awesome. But don't feel like you guys have to stay in that avenue. But what is a good age to start in recruiting? And I guess um, that's such a tough question. Um, as a, you know, former college coach of a long time, it's never, ever, 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 ever too early, right? To get yourself out there and to market yourself and to make videos and, and, and do those things now, today, tomorrow. Like, but is there ever a time that you think Lacey is, is, is too late? And if they, someone does feel like they're too late, then what? Yeah, I think that's definitely very interesting. I think it's easier to be a little later of a bloomer now than it was just a year or two ago. And I think there's avenues too for if you are feeling like you're late to the process, there's junior college, there's a lot of ways. I think now junior college specifically is becoming a lot more common where you see pitchers especially like you have um oh gosh their names are escaping me right now I know Crystal Goodman from Alabama amazing pitcher this past year she came from a junior college you're yep. seeing a lot of SEC level um and big playing level girls come from but Alabama actually has Courtney Gettings as well who mm -hmm. went division one mid-major and then mm -hmm. went JUCO and then came back and went yeah. major D1 I think it's never too late. You just may have to take a different avenue to get where you want. Um, but in terms of when to start, if you know you're invested and you know that's what you want to do, start sending emails, start making videos like Allison said. I mean, you're only setting yourself up to be better at it as you go along. And you're going to be more comfortable talking to people too, because that's something that coaches run into all the time that when they get a phone call or an email or anything like that. The and it's painful. Yes. <laughs> now, if you, if you had one piece of advice to a kid that really, really wants to play and wants to find a way to play in college, what do you, what do you think it would be? Um, I think you have to start your fitness, like strength and conditioning development now. I honestly think that's something that's been overlooked, but that can really start to help you develop and understand how to develop more quickly as a softball player because you're going to understand your body and how it works and you're going to be able to apply that to pitching, hitting, fielding a lot easier than first thing you're going to do before your coach sees you hit a ball, throw a ball, pitch a ball, you're going to have to do some sort of running. So if you can put yourself in a position to stand out that very, that's your first impression. And it's so important. So I agree. I'm almost on the bandwagon of as you get in your later years and closer to older high school, save your money on the hitting coach and get a, get an instruct, get a trainer instead. I agree. What, um, Oh, they got it. How can you possibly pick what, um, do you have a most memorable softball moment? Oh my gosh, Whew, that is hard. So many games, it's hard to pick just one. Ah, uh, let's see. I guess it would have to be um, my junior year when we went to the World Series for the first time in 10 years, but it was the game to get there. So I'll give you guys a little backstory. Um, we played Michigan and we hosted them for Super Regionals and we got blown out in game one. We lost like 17 to three. I was pitching, not great. Mm. And that was, I think, the biggest loss any team had ever had in a Super Regional. See you guys, it happens to everybody. <laughs> yes. Lacey, but what year was this? This that was 14. 14. Mm -hmm. Yes. But at the same time, like that happened, obviously we were all devastated, but you knew in our locker room right after that, that we were winning the doubleheader tomorrow to go to the World Series. Like, there was just no doubt about it. We knew it. 
And we had that sense of like, there's no way anyone's going to come here and do that in our house. So then the following day we played a double header. Now it's nice. They have like three days to actually play super regionals. We used to play in two. Um, we won the first game seven to zero. And then the second game was really close and we ended up winning on my teammate, Courtney Sinus walk off home run in the seventh inning. So I that was the game. I remember yeah, my general moment for sure. That's awesome. That's an awesome, awesome story. This is a great question and something people ask me a lot personally. Um, what are your thoughts on if you are 14 years old and you have the ability to move up and play up in an age group, what are your thoughts on playing up versus staying in your age group? And I'll answer first, Lacey, and then you give me your opinion. If we were talking two years ago when the only recruiting events I was going to were 14 and under, then I would say stay down. But now with the recruiting changes, I'm a little more apt to saying playing up a little bit isn't such a bad idea. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter what age group you're playing if your team isn't playing in the right tournaments and if your team isn't competitive. Yeah, that's a huge thing because, I mean, it is very true that the best teams get the best fields and those are the ones that the coaches are going to. You can't hide from that or pretend like it's not real because it is. Right. Um, but the other thing is, like, you have to find a team that you're going to play on. Right. Yeah, you could be playing on that high-level team, but are you getting playing time for coaches to see you? Are you actually developing and getting better? Or if you're sitting on the bench, that's not helping you either. So and I think that's a balance. Specifically 14s to 16s, there's no difference in anything. The ball size is the same and the pitching distance is the same. So if you're able and you feel confident in the 16 new team that you're about to jump to, go for it. If we're talking 12s and 14s hold it, and 10s and 12s, whole different animal because different size ball, different size pitching distance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that you maybe can do a little too soon if you're jumping from 10 to 12 early. Just there's so many differences in the ball size. Hand sizes are smaller when you're younger. So I almost wish this is something I thought about a lot. I wish that until 12 and under, you could keep the 11 inch ball and just go back to 40 feet. Wow. And then until 14 and under, you could move up to the 12 and just go to 43. That would definitely but, change some things. Yeah. I would, I would love to play with that little 11 incher though. I'll tell you that. Um, okay. Um, what is it? We talked a little bit about this earlier, but this is a really awesome question. And I think we all can kind of bounce off each other, Alicia, Lacey, and myself. What is it like to play for a division one school? Now I'll preface it with saying I played mid-major softball. So I played at a smaller division one school and Lacey played at probably the, I don't know how, how many kids go to Louisville, Alicia? About 25 K. And what are we looking at at Florida State? I want to say it's like 45 plus. I was going to say 50,000. So here's three different Division I players. One had 50,000 approximately. One had 25,000. And mine had 15,000. So, so many different levels. But I think we can all say that if to play Division I, besides how hard it is to get there, if, you're, if you really love it, you can make it happen, um, is the absolute time commitment and – you have to be 100% all in or you, will, you won't make it. It's, it's, a, it's a job if you want to look at it that way. And the time commitment alone and the sacrifices that you have to make to be able to do it and stick it out and play um, is, is pretty extreme. But it's also, you guys can speak on your stories, the most beautiful thing that I've ever, I have two children. So for me to say it's the most beautiful thing I can, but it is really close. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, to feed off of that for me, it was, you know, crazy to just talk about and going into a city where you represent something across your chest that where you represent other student athletes, the other sports, that, you know, that town, everything. It's not just your travel ball team anymore. You're representing a whole university. So it's just very you know, you said it, it's, it, it is a job. You treat everything like it's a business. And unfortunately, sometimes that can be a good and bad thing. Um, cause trust me, it is very hard. And there's a lot of things along the way that can really make or break you in those moments, but it's definitely well worth it. And Lacey, I know you can say the same. We were talking about it earlier. It's the greatest time of my life. I wish I could play it all over again. Same. Absolutely. Like if I could have those four years back, of course I would do it. I don't think there's any college softball player out there that wouldn't, 
Um, but it's hard. We talked about this earlier, just that freshman year, your first mm -hmm. year is hard. And someone asked in the comments earlier, did I ever want to quit softball? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thought about it time. quite a few and, times. <laughs> yeah, and I'm talking like growing up. I remember telling my parents, I'm never playing softball again after a bad day. Of course, a couple days later, I'm like, yeah, I'm playing softball. <laughs> but, but in college too, like there were times that I would be crying because it was so hard and I couldn't figure it out. And my coaches were awesome in that time and helping me figure out how to manage my emotions. But you also, it's, really neat you grow as a person and just as a human in so many aspects of your life because you're pushed to limits that you didn't know you had or you're forced to learn how to deal with different types of people like there's just so much that you learn and you develop as a person to be better and better just in the workforce in all aspects of life because you committed to play college softball and committed to do the hard things. 100% and also Lacey and Ali and I we all um, went across you know we left our home so for us I'm from California originally and I played ball in Kentucky and leaving what I knew for 18 years was so difficult and we joked about this earlier the amount of times I called my parents crying and when I saw my dog for the first time on video I cried I mean those are all real and it's it, it's difficult but again well worth it because it you know, sets you up for the real world. Totally. Let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit back to, um, actually, let's do one more recruiting question since we're on that. Lacey, what um, do you think was the most difficult, challenging part of your process, your recruiting process? Hmm, that's a good question. In terms of recruiting, I think it was challenging, this for me personally, not for me to figure out where I was going, but to sit down as a family and kind of figure out with my mom and dad, you know, what that looked like. Because, we actually, yeah, we yeah. actually all wanted different things. Like I knew I wanted to go to Florida State. My mom wanted me to go to Ole Miss. My dad wanted me to go to NC State. And like, I was making that decision to go far away from my parents. And I think that weighed on them a little bit, but I always knew I had an idea of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. But that was challenging, just being able to express that and do what you think is best for you because this is you setting yourself up for the future. So I think that can be challenging for a lot of people is sure. making the decision for them and not trying to please others. Alicia, how about you? What, what was your hardest part? In, I mean, kind of the same process. I mean, I, I, when Lacey was talking, I was like, that was probably it. But I think my biggest thing was for me to find a home away from home. Sure. So I felt like, you know, when I was looking for those avenues, it was hard. I was searching for things that I don't think can be, you know, like that are replaceable. So I think for me, that was the hardest part. I wanted it to be just like home, but at the same time, I needed to get out of my bubble and just kind of free myself from that kind of cocoon that I was in the whole time. So I think for me, the hardest part was just branching out and opening up and kind of opening up my heart to other things for sure. Because it's easy to stick in your bubble and it's easy to feel that normal, you know, day-to-day -day thing and getting out of outside of the box is scary. I mean, it truly is, especially when you're 17 years old I mean it's wild so I think that was the hardest part for me sure now Lacey what do you think if we're talking about different ages of pitcher so if we're talking about a 10 year old pitcher how many pitches velocity what are we what, what are we looking at as far as a, a good a strong 10, 10 year old pitcher what should she have in her toolbox already um I would say at 10, you should just be learning the foundational movements of pitching. And I know there's a lot of people that start sooner. For instance, I have two nine-year-old clients that moved here from California and they started pitching two years ago, which is different. Right. Um, but I think at 10, like I'm not yeah. teaching them anything other than a fastball. If they're really good, then maybe I'm teaching them a changeup. but they can always move better. But you also, to me, like you don't want to overcoach them because they may be doing some things that work for them and figuring it out. And I don't want to be that coach that's like, do this, do this, do this, because I could be coaching them away from what they will eventually be very good at. Sure. Um, that's so. amazing advice. So like all of you guys that go to hitting and pitching instructors, I couldn't agree more. Um, 
the older you get, especially when you get to college, the best coaches out there are a little more hands-off as far as concrete changes and a lot more hands-on as far as your natural movements and what works for you as an individual. So really keep that in mind when you're agree or disagree, Lacey, like as you're growing up and you're picking your instructors, be careful parents that they are not coaching your athlete out of athletic movements. Yeah. And I think there's times where like, I know for me as a pitching coach, I have my couple absolutes that I'm like, okay, I know that all really good pitchers do these things. So if I am doing other things that I'm going to coach them more towards that movement. But now that I've learned more about it too, I'm just going to coach them towards like, what is good for your body to do and how does it work? And I definitely never want to put them in a situation where it's like, okay, their body just can't do this. This is going to hurt them. Like, I'm never going to do that. But I think there's times when I was giving lessons, you know, years back, I've only been doing it for a couple years since I got out of college, but like, I used to coach a lot differently. So it's on us as coaches, but I think parents too, to continue to learn as much as you can, because things are ever evolving and we're learning so much more about pitching and hitting now than we ever used to know because we have slow motion cameras and we have technology and we have all these things like you can't hide from it. Yep. And using technology is so, so, so huge. So if you're going into, to an instructor who, and there's a lot of old school, old school guys I know that don't really want to mess a ton with, um, video and analysis and things like that. And I get that there's a, something really beautiful about feeling your way through things too, but uh, make sure you guys are keeping your eyes and ears open to all the, all the technologies that are out there. I mean, I know Lacey at softball rebellion uses a few things, um, in her analysis of pictures. Like it's awesome right now at this time, like they're taking kids that want to send in their videos and have Lacey analyze them and break them down for you. What an amazing tool that like we get to use now during this crazy time. Um, and we'll put a couple of those links in the chat just so you guys know what Lacey does and what Softball Rebellion does and all the resources that they have because it's pretty awesome. And obviously they have hitting too. Lacey doesn't do those. The um, hitting guys do them, but it's really cool for all athletes. Yes. Um, oh, I have a question I'm sorry. To answer real quick. Um, yep. Someone asked, as a nine-year-old, should you be focusing on speed? Um, again, I think focusing on just how you move, but at nine, yeah, I think everyone has to learn how to move at a high intent level so like if you're learning how to run you're still going to run fast so I want you to be able to throw hard at times like not think about mechanics but learn how to move your body quickly and then yeah we want to make sure you're not doing anything that's going to hurt you but yeah as my if I'm coaching nine-year-olds I push them to go fast you cannot with any any athlete you cannot train all the time at 70 percent speed and then step up in a game and throw effectively at 100 percent speed yes so i think pushing even more so when i worked with young hitters i pushed swinging hard and aggressively more so sometimes than mechanics depending on what we were working on and i think same with pitching there's a time and a place to really just step on the gas and not worry all the time about where it's going yeah for sure and you, you break it down into times like now we were saying because we're in this break period, yes, you can work on the little skills and the mechanics. Maybe you're someone that struggles to go fast. So if that's you, then work on throwing harder. And, you know, it's just an intent thing. Sometimes people can't teach you to go faster. It's just something that one, you probably have to get stronger going back to fitness that we talk about all the time. If you are focused on speed, like those are the things that are going to help you get faster, just learning how to move your body fast in other ways. And that will translate to your pitching. But if you can't jump high or jump far or do those things quickly, it's going to be a little more challenging to do that in a pitching movement that like you have to do so many other things. Right. For sure. And if you don't push them to do it at nine, then you're not going to be able to push them to do it at 13 and 17. Um, Lacey, to, uh, I had a, yeah, Lacey, I had a private question what is advice you can give to parents during the recruiting process? I think this question is awesome. So if you want to give some insight, that would be great. I would say, I don't want this to sound bad, but almost like stay out of it as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> because like it really is, it's their future. And if you do a lot of it for them, like as a coach, I received emails that you could tell were written by parents sometimes, or even parents would say like, Oh, my daughter. Voicemail. That's I had voicemails that you could tell were left by parents. 
Yeah. And that's not telling me that they are an independent um, person that's going to be able to make the transition to college and like be accountable for themselves and be responsible. I want to know that they are doing the bulk of the work. And I think truly driven players, they don't need to be pushed by anyone else. Sure. I, you can definitely nudge them here and there, but if they want it, they're going to do it on their own. If you're the one that's constantly having to say, Hey, send these emails, do this, do that. Like they're probably not cut out for college softball. Give them the resources and then let them take the reins for sure. Are you saying that mommy and daddy can't go to college with you? <laughs> <laughs> they cannot, they can come visit. <laughs> Another good lead in for a recruiting question that I had on here. Um, there's actually two and we can roll through them a little bit. Um, one of them is about, um, recruiting companies. Um, we're going to have to be careful on that one, um, mainly because of our positions. And so we do have some connections with some recruiting companies. Um, but I will say from a coaching perspective, and then Lacey, you can go. Um, I think all resources are good resources. I think if you have the financial abilities to have someone in your corner that can really, really help you, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Um, but I also think that a lot of parents buy into these things and do not know that they still have to do the work. They are not going to do the work for you. It is still going to be up to your athlete to really push. So do I think they're worth, worth investing in? If you are able to, maybe. Um, however, your kid still needs to get on the email train and still needs to be sending their videos and doing what they need to be doing. It's not, it does not mean that coaches are going to knock on your door. Yeah. Um, I think the thing is, Everything that they are offering you, you can probably do on your own, much cheaper. That's how I've always looked at it. It can be very costly. I know there's some things that certain services do for free. There are some which, very cool technologies and things that can, that can, for instance, like if you send emails, you can tell who opens your emails. You can tell what coaches have read your emails. Like there's some cool things like that that could help you, but they don't, like you said, they don't do the work for you. Right. So it's not something that you absolutely need to do. No. no. But if you're looking for help and you just don't have a lot of resources to figure out what you should do, then yeah, of course, find someone you can ask and they have a lot of information on it. Just make sure it's financially affordable. Totally. I know that from a college coaching standpoint, there were certain companies and recruiters that I developed relationships with that I 100% trusted. Absolutely. So it just, it's about who you're working with you know, if you're going to invest in something like that. But the second question to tie into some recruiting stuff, um, how do you start showing off your skills to recruiter and what skills should we show off? Video, 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 video. <laughs> Lacey, I would really like you to tell um, the story about how Florida State even knew who you were. Oh, yes. So basically I decided what schools that I wanted to send my recruiting video, which it was a DVD then. <laughs> um, I decided which ones I wanted to send it to based on the academic program that they had. So at the time I wanted to be a marine biologist. Didn't happen, but I still really <laughs> that side of things. Um, but so I picked my 10 schools that I liked for softball and they had the program that I wanted and I sent out my DVD. And that's actually how Coacha, we call her Coacha, Coach Alameda, at Florida State um, started recruiting me because she liked my video. She liked the way I spun the ball. And actually, once I was a player, she still had the DVD in her office. And I, I didn't watch it with her, but one of my teammates caught her watching it and was like, that girl looks really familiar. And, you know, there I was. So that was really beneficial for me. And then also, I know when I was coaching, if someone sent me an email with the video, I would always watch it. Same. Always. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's, I mean, the number one way that I can say that is easy. You can go outside and hit off a tee and prop up your cell phone. These do not have to be flaming balls uh, and music and, you know, lightning bolts. Like this is like, you do not need a professional or to spend money to get video of yourself out there and making social media profiles specifically for softball is really, really, really important. Now that was never a thing. I'm not that old but I can, uh, Lacey and Alicia, that was never a thing for us. So no. it's an amazing tool though now that some people are really, really using well. So that's a really good starting block to get yourself out there. Um, and there's, again, with all this downtime, there's no excuse why you guys can't start making videos. So now's a really good time to do that. Yes. 
And even on those videos, like to go over them, you know, I think coaches, you guys in the recruiting process can say, they know when you cut out all the best reps and make yourself look really, really great. I think coaches, we talked about this earlier about the competitiveness, you know, if you miss a ground ball and a girl kind of shrugs and shows her attitude, instead of missing a ground ball and kind of like hitting her glove and getting more into it, it shows that coach that you're really competitive and you want it and you want to get better. And, you know, softball is a game of failure. So I think making it super organic and super natural and being yourself is really important in those videos. There's a really awesome question in here about that, Lacey. Can you speak on a little bit, any advice you have when you're pitching and you think you're pitching well, but you're, team or your defense may not be doing so well we I get it I've done it I've, I played shortstop that was me sometimes but what is your advice how can you like what can you do as a pitcher um not only to take care of yourself in that moment but possibly to help your teammates in that moment too yeah so I think um for me that that happened a lot when I was a freshman and it was something that I would get frustrated about let's say like a blue pick went in it wasn't even something the defense did but like, oh man, like I beat her and she still got on. What, what do I do now? And that would cause a lot of frustration for me. And so I really had to start thinking about like, what is my job that I'm trying to do? And did I do my job? Right. As a pitcher, my job is to throw quality pitches. That is the only thing that I can control. I can't control if I get outs because I can't control anybody else. Can't control the hitter, fielders, nothing. Can't control if I throw strikes technically because the umpire is involved, but I can control if I threw a quality pitch. So if I did that and I, you know, an error happened or a bloop went in, like I had to tell myself, okay, I got my job done. I'm going to go do it again. And that was that. And that's how you have to look at it. Um, but I think when you see your teammates getting down in a situation like that, like they probably felt the weight of the world was on their shoulders and they're like, I let everyone down. I know as a pitcher, I felt that a lot. Um, but talking to them, often is super helpful so I know for me let's say I just gave up a hit I'd go to my shortstop and second baseman like all right I'm gonna get you a ground ball right here we're gonna turn a double play and just constantly talking with them about game like things not just chattering but actually what was going to happen and how I was going to change things like I'm gonna go get them I'm going at them right here and that really helped me and our coaches kind of had to coach that out of me because I was pretty quiet on the mound initially, but then once I got used to it, I was always saying something and it became part of my routine. And I think it helps you keep it out, keep you out of your own head too. Yeah. And that's super, super important for all you crazy pitchers out there. I said it. <laughs> um, a question, this is a great one. Um, what is an average day in the life of college? We talked about this a little bit earlier on a different call we were on. Um, there's basically two seasons in softball. Um, there's fall, which is very, very, very long and strenuous. And then there's spring, which basically is traveling and eating and taking care of your body. So let's talk about fall, Lacey, if you don't mind, since that's really the hardest part of the entire season that most people don't even realize is the hardest part. Yeah. So fall is challenging, one, because especially as a freshman, you're coming in for the first time and you've never experienced practices like this. You've never had your own schedule of classes. All these things are new. Um, so we, there's also two separate things in the fall. There's eight hour weeks and there's 20 hour weeks. So eight hour weeks are individuals time. So you right now, the way of the ruling is, um, I believe you have four hours that you can spend with your coaches and then you have four hours you can spend in the weight room. So that's how that works. But I'm going to take you guys through like a 20 hour week, which is basically when you're also playing fall games and you have your full amount of time throughout the week to have team practice. So it usually starts in the morning and most um, teams lift early. So we either had a six o'clock time, a seven o'clock time or an eight o'clock time to lift depending on your class schedule. So most schools, by the way, are not that generous. Most schools, everyone is going at 6 a.m. It doesn't matter what your schedule is. That was me, yep. 100%. Yes. yes, so we did both ways. My freshman year, everyone was at six. And then I think, my junior and senior year, we had the different um, times. So kind of depends mm -hmm. on your coaches, on what they want to do, and on if everyone's class schedule is flexible or not. And your yeah. facilities, how many weight rooms you have on campus, how many strength coaches, everything. Yep. So that could be different at every school, but generally you're going to lift in the morning. And then I'd go to class. Let's say I had two or three classes, and usually your classes in college are a little bit shorter. 
So we would have like 45 minute classes sometimes. And then other times you might have like a double block where the classes are a little bit longer. Um, so you go to your classes, let's say I had three and there were times where they'd go back to back to back or there's times where you might have a class and then a break and then a class and a class. So that again, depends on your schedule. Um, but that takes up a pretty good chunk of your morning. So then from there, if you have time to go grab lunch or a snack, you do that. Um, sometimes you don't have time for them and you're lucky to get to the locker room, grab a granola bar and then head out to practice. Um, so you have to plan really well because fueling your body is super important. And luckily um, where I was, we had a fueling station and things like that where they helped you out with that and provided you food, which was nice. That is um, rare. That is not the norm. Yes, not the norm. Happens certain places, not everywhere. Um, practice usually started for us around two o'clock, but the really cool thing for me at FSU that I realized doesn't happen everywhere is we were always there early and practicing before practice started. So 30 minutes to an hour before, you could guarantee that probably 75% of the team, as long as they weren't still in class, was there getting extra hitting reps, extra defense reps, doing something to work on softball before practice started. And then usually practice was about three hours. After that was over, you might have tutoring. I know I had tutoring for a couple different classes and usually that was at like, like seven. So let's say practice ended at five, I'd have time to eat and then go right to tutoring and then maybe more homework in bed. And uh, Lacey did not mention um, getting any sort of, if you're injured or have any sort of nagging anything, there's treatment time, there's study hall time, um, there's, a, there's study groups, there's a lot of other things that, you know, could be worked in there, but you are pretty much book solid from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. And if you're not, it probably means you're not doing something that you should be doing. Right. That's kind of how we always put it. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. That was a great explanation. Okay. Is it worth, this is a great question. Is it worth traveling to places like Florida, Texas, California to play softball just to get your name out there? And this goes right back to what we talked about. If you're not willing to leave from home or within a few hour radius of your home, there is no reason for you to be flying across the country playing everywhere. Get on a strong team that plays in good regional tournaments because every coach in your area and your region will see you that way. If you are open then yeah, it's always great. If they're the best tournaments and you're playing on the best teams, then I think it's worth it. Yeah, I agree with you totally. If you know you want to play close to home, go to their camps and yeah. play locally and those things. But if you do know, hey, I want to be out in front of the top college coaches, see as many coaches as I can, yes, I think it's worth going to those tournaments, but obviously it's very expensive. So my other suggestion would be um, maybe you can guest play with the team if you're not financially able to afford an entire season. I understand that. That was tough. Um, try to see if you can guest play with the team for maybe a big Colorado tournament. I know I've encouraged some of the girls I work with around here to do that, and it's gone really well for them. And then, it, you know, it takes that coach seeing you one time to remember you if you're doing something well, and then maybe that sparks the conversation. So you don't have to do it all year. Do it if you can, obviously, if it's available to you, because you're going to experience great competition that's going to better prepare you for college also. That was a big thing for me. Like, I don't think I would have gone in as prepared if I had not transitioned to an upper level travel team versus continuing to play locally. No doubt. I think all of us, um, Alicia, myself and Lacey, all went through the transition of playing for a team that we thought was good because we didn't know any better to playing for a team that was actually good and was going to get us where we wanted to go. And that doesn't mean that your more local team cannot get you in a good spot. It just depends on what good spot means to you guys, you know, and that's, that's all, um, that's all relative. Um, when going to showcase tournaments and camps, what's something that helps you catch a coach's eye? So Lazy, tell, like when you were coaching, when a kid came to camp, what's something they could do that you would write them down in a hurry or be like, man, I got to see that kid again. Yeah, obviously early on, it's going to be athleticism. If I, see, if I see that they just blow everybody else away, yes, you're going to stand out. But also something that I think you don't see enough is girls that are outgoing are willing to ask questions that are very invested in, you know, a certain drill that you're doing or something like that. That's going to speak volumes to me because I want someone outgoing in my program. 
that's going to be willing to then when they're in that position of like, oh, now I'm a player that's coaching these other young players, they're going to give back to. So don't be in your little shy bubble. That is how you don't get noticed. You have to be willing to get uncomfortable, introduce yourself to people. Like honestly, introduce in a good handshake. I will remember you if you have a good handshake. That is something too. Yeah. And I think uh, a few things that can get absolute no's um, more so than even get absolute yeses are being on your phone. Put your phone away when you're at tournaments. If you're in between games and you have an hour and a half break, go watch a softball game and try to get better and learn. Don't sit on your phone the whole time. Don't lay between your boyfriend's legs in the bleachers. Don't have your pants unbuttoned walking around. There's so many things that you can do to get you marked off the list in a hurry. Don't let your parents carry your bat bag. I mean, if anything, walk, walk in the ballpark with a McDonald's. I mean, you know, oh, McDonald's fast stuff, food. that is fast, the worst. Fast food between games or oh. at a college camp. Man. Yeah, that's a good one, Alicia. So there's some things that you can definitely just steer away from. Like when you are at the ball field, you are at your workspace, yes. you know, and you're a professional and you're there to do business. And if you really, really love it, those little sacrifices are totally, totally worth it and go a long way. And I know that a big coming out of your shell can be really challenging for some of us. Um, but there is nothing that gets noticed more than swag. And I think that stands even above athleticism, Lacey, honestly, if there's a kid that shows up at camp, checks herself in, looks me in the eye, parents aren't speaking for her. I mean, that's something that like, I have to find that kid. I have to watch that kid later that day. You know, that's, that's a big deal. I agree with that. That's something that too, like you can't reproduce. That's going to make you unique because no one else is going to have that same thing that you have. Awesome. So we are, I mean, time is flying, you guys. These are such amazing questions. We have about 10 minutes left, um, give or take, but I'm going to try to work through just a few more of these um, questions. Okay. Here's a great one. Um, how many play players are on a division one college team? That is such a wide question. Um, there are teams that there are teams that carry twelve bodies for per, personal college choice, uh, college coach choice and preference, or because financial dis reasons. Not all Division One schools have are fully funded. And for those that don't know, fully funded means they have twelve full scholarships that they can break up however they see fit. But there are a very large, very large number of Division One schools who are not fully funded. So there are also programs, some very, very competitive major programs that choose to carry 35 kids on their roster and redshirt 15 of them, 10 of them, whatever they choose. So that is completely up to the coaching staff, but definitely something to look into when you decide Florida State is known for redshirting pitcher, freshman pitchers. Mm -hmm. One well, coming from Louisville. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So like things – Things happen at different programs that you really need to know like that. Like chances are if you're a freshman pitcher and there's somebody above you at Florida State, you're going to redshirt. So that's a really, really common thing and things to look into. That's a great question, though. Um, what are some fitness tips we all have? Let's all give a little bit of a specific to what we're in right now with the quarantine. Let's all give a little bit of um, feedback on what we think would be easy to execute, super helpful to all ages right now. All right, I will go first. So this is something that one, I think it's great for all ages to do, doesn't matter, introduces you to like functional foundational strength and it's really good for mobility. So yoga, I think oh, is- Oh, good one. So, um, and I have a favorite um, YouTube channel that's free that I subscribe to. So it's called Yoga with Cassandra, Cassandra with a K. And she has like 10 minute ones, 20 minute ones. They're they she has have strength them. yoga. She has all different types of ones. I know the, I know the channel. Yes. So I think that's great for anyone to start because you can't go wrong, honestly. That's a great one. I think a really easy one that is also amazing for the whole family and really good in this specific situation are family walks. Help push your little siblings in a stroller. Get outside. Just get outside together. Um, and j just make it sp specific. And if, if you're an athlete wants to then run to the stop sign until you catch up and then run back, or you can make it really fun and really tie the whole family in and have some extra time together. 
Yeah, like for me, um, I'm really big on accountability. So I like to do like these Zoom calls, FaceTimes with my girlfriends here in Louisville, and we all work out together. Um, so that's, that's really one. fun. And of course, I'm a fur baby mom. So anytime I can go to the park with my dog and run with her and do all that um, is super fun for me. Um, but if I'm indoors, honestly, anything body weight, me working on wall sits and planks, those are the death of me and tricep pushups, um, things like that, that I can just do with. Uh, my body is great. And I'm like six foot. So my body weight's enough for me. So oh, we feel so bad that you're so tall. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this has been so incredible. Um, we have literally a thousand more questions that we have received and could answer. What we're going to do is we are going to take all of these questions on here and copy, copy them and take them. And we're going to have um, mix them up between mostly Lacey, but if she needs help from Alicia and myself, and we're going to get make sure that you guys get the answers. Um, we're going to figure out how we're going to execute that, whether it be a little video from Lacey on our Self Law Rebellion page. So make sure to um, follow us off our rebellion on all their social media channels. Um, she might be putting some of them there. We might put them, some of them through softball youth. We may try to email them out to you, but we want to make sure that all of your guys' questions get answered. We have an unbelievable speaker coming next week. Most of you guys, should, all of you guys should be getting an email about that probably tomorrow. Um, she's an Italian Olympian, one of the top 10 hitters in the country right now. And I think will be one of the most amazing hitters in, in the softball space for a very long time to come. Um, so that's really exciting and something to look forward to. If everyone could please type in the chat how grateful they are to have such an awesome, awesome pitcher and instructor like Lacey to be here. That would be awesome. We're gonna do this as a weekly thing. Lacey will definitely be back, um, and she's, we're also going to put some information about Softball Rebellion in the chat here so you guys can make sure to follow all their stuff, check out their, all the really awesome things that they're doing during this time. She's an unbelievable, unbelievable instructor and pitcher, and um, we're really grateful that we have her as a resource. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.